And you haven't signed yet, have you? And I said, no, I haven't. And he says, good, because Erwin Allen has this series he wants to discuss with you, and we want you to come up to the office. I turned around to a very dear friend of mine since I was a baby called Red Buttons, and I said to Red, I said, what do I do? And he said, well, I've worked with Erwin Allen many, many times. He's uh, a very successful uh, producer. He said, get out of here. He said, go up there. I don't want to ever see you again. And I went up there, and uh, Erwin said to me, he says, uh, didn't you work on Voyage to Bottomless Sea? And I said, yes, I did. He says, I thought so. He says, look, we're going to do this series called Lost in Space. There's a part of a robot going to be in there. I don't know what we're going to do with it. I really don't know what a robot's going to do in any way. He said, but would you like to play the part? And I said, yes, I'd love it. He says, there's one catch. You've got to fit in the costume because it's almost completed. <laughs> so I went down uh, to the mill, and that's when I first met Robert Kinoshita, who designed our robot. He also designed Robbie the robot. And I got inside the robot. Mr. Allen came down, and he said um, to Bob Kinoshita, he says, how's he fitting? Now, Kinoshita knows how much an actor wants a job. <laughs> And I was fitted in there pretty tight, and he said, oh, it's doing just fine. And Erwin says, get, uh, get him out. I got out, and he looked at me, he says, you got the job. He says, now, as I said before, I don't know what a robot can do. I don't know what we're even going to do with the robot. But he says, do me one favor, and that is make something out of our robot, which I really appreciate that. You sure did, too. All these years, now it's been 33 years, uh, that robot could have been destroyed, totally destroyed. It was in the mill, but when the mill was sold, that area of 20th Century Fox was sold, it went into storage, and it had been destroyed by Hanna-Barbera, totally. It was, it was a shambles. And I want to personally, in front of everybody, thank the gentleman who saved it from uh, destruction. Now we had the uh, we had the junkyard in space that couldn't uh, destroy the robot. And I want to thank Kevin Burns for saving our robot. Nice to see this. Uh, I was working on the Zorro show at Disney, and then I started doing the Wonderful World at Disney. And then they called me on Disney. And Adrian, what, what year was this? Do you know this was like mid fifties? Yeah, Disney did a show. It was the first show anybody ever did, a documentary show about an hour long, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. On on yeah, space travel, cool. space flight. Uh, Willie Lay, Werner von Braun, uh, missiles going into space. Nothing had ever been done like that before, and it was a fact. By the way. You never see it anymore, except it's in schools all over the United States. They show it to youngsters. And occasionally on the Disney Yeah, it's, it's a terrific piece, it really is. And I was able to narrate that, which was... It must have been very exciting. Oh, it was exciting, and, and I and, and, you know, loved working to the footage on that. And then ten years later, you were asked to be the voice of Lost in Space. And, uh, but uh, at the time, I guess, Erwin Allen was looking for a voice for the robot. And uh, you were called in. Uh, and can you explain how that went? Well, many of you probably know the story. I'll repeat it again. Uh, I Love was, you. I was, I was the, I was the narrator on the show. And my agent got a call one day, week, week later. And this is this is probably about three or four weeks before the show went on the air on CBS. And uh, Irwin was calling and saying, "I'm looking for a voice for the robot. Uh, I'd like to meet with Dick at, at Studio Four, 20th Century Fox, Tuesday at four o'clock." So I show up and I said, Erwin, uh, I said, I presume what you were looking for here is a stiff, mechanical sounding, robotian kind of stiff sound. And he says, my dear boy, this is 1965. I was a dear boy in 1965. <laughs> <laughs> he says, he said, that's precisely what I do not want. He said, this ship is blasting off in a very advanced year, 1997, he said, which is in retrospect kind of humorous. And he said, what I want is a cultured, low-key, Alexander Scurby kind of approach. Scurby, of course, being the fabulous New York narrator and actor. <laughs> Don't touch my money. <laughs> <laughs> 
Kirby, uh, this great, wonderful New York actor uh, and narrator who did the National Geographic specials and stuff like didn't color the words, cultured sounding, low key. I said, sure, okay. So now I'm reading the lines for Irwin, and I'm doing my best Scurby imitation. And I'm reading the lines, and I'm saying, and this is a little like the computer voice Hal in 2001. Uh, I'm saying, danger, Will Robinson, that does not compute. No, I said, that's not it. Read it again. And I say, you know, I'm saying, my sensors indicate an alien is approaching. He said, that's not right. Do it again. And we do this for about 10 minutes. He said, look, Dick, he said, he said, I'm not hearing what I want. He says, I appreciate you coming in. You're still the narrator on the show. But he said, I'm going to have to look further for a voice. I said, I understand. And I said, I appreciate the call. And now I take, open up my shake case. I take my distance, my reading glasses off my head. I put my distance glasses on my head. I close the case. I'll say, I see you soon. I take seven st steps toward the door. I'm within two more steps of walking out the door. And what possessed me on this, I do not know yet. I said, Erwin, let me, let me try one more thing for you. And now in my best mechanical, stiff, <laughs> Robotian manner, I say, danger, Will Robinson, that does not compute. He says, my god, that's the Alexander Scurby approach I wanted. What the hell took you so long? <laughs> and honestly, <laughs> Honestly, I had to turn my back because I didn't want to laugh in his face. I was just convulsed <laughs> about this. But it was a class, it was a great learning experience because I learned that day that what people say they want and what they may really want or hear what they like could be two entirely diametric things and may not be the same to each other. He'd walk out, I'd do my lines, and maybe at that point Bill or Marta were coming in to do some of their loops or something like that. We talked to each other just briefly momentarily. And that was it. I didn't have a chance to really visit with the cast very much. That's that's true. Yeah, I mean, in fact, I think you know he's he's become more integrated into the cast family. I, I would say in more recent years than than uh, in the years of production on the show. Oh sure. I, I gotta tell, I gotta say something here because uh, this man has become a very dear dear friend, and I have tremendous respect for him. And we've done a lot of shows together. However, let me go back a few years. I go to the screening of uh, what we call rushes. One time, because that's all the time I ever had. And I hear this other voice. And I said, my God, what's You were expecting to hear your voice, right? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and all of a sudden, I hear this other voice. I don't know who this man is, nothing. I go home, and I'm ranting and raving to my wife. This isn't fair. I don't understand this. And she's the level-headed person in the family. She's the one with the intelligence. And she looked at me, and she said, Bob, relax. Stop it. She said, this is a successful show. It's going to go all over the world. It's going into many different countries. You don't speak those languages. You're originally from New York. You have trouble with English. <laughs> then I found out who was doing my voice. And that is an honor, because he's the best. And there's many actors. It's going to be a performer again. I, I insist, as long as it's within my power, that the only one who should be in the robot is Bob May, and the only one who should do his voice is Dick Tufel. And this is a You know, then, as it seems now. And so, uh, God bless them. God bless them both. I brought Bob in to do studs. Oh, that was quite interesting. And, and, yes. and Bob... He flunked the physical. <laughs> no, and the unique thing about studs, I have to say, is that, you know, in, in Lost in Space, in the series, a, a, one of the credits that has to be given to Bob May, other than personalizing the suit, like a master actor and mime and puppeteer, skills all of which he had to possess, you know, a lot of people forget the fact that even though Dick did his voice, Bob had to memorize all the dialogue. Bob had to memorize the dialogue like an actor on the set. He had to come in there as a performer, memorizing the lines, doing all of that interaction and reaction to, to Jonathan and Billy. And in a very hot studio, in a very hot set, and I know after doing Fantasy Worlds of Rowan Allen, what a physically challenging, horrifically demanding job that is. And, you know, and Bob would come out 
cut and sweating and, you know, and, and really physically challenged to do that. That's why I didn't want him to talk about Bermuda shorts. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so Bob, so, so, uh, but when we did the Studs TV show, which was going to be their last episode, they asked me, they said, could we get the robot on the Studs? And I rationalized that it was the 20th show, so we should be able to do it as a promotional stunt. And Billy was going to come on. He, he wore Mark Goddard's outfit. You know, came out and looked like Billy Mummy and Mark Goddard's outfit. And, and Bob had to ad lib the whole half hour, forty minutes it took to tape it. He had to do all ad libs and reactions to Mark DiCarlo because it was all very free form. And then, uh, and, and Bob did a tremendous job keeping up with a very, very quick-minded host. And then we brought Dick into the studio to match the dialogue, and there are some outtakes from that show, which only I have, which are brilliantly funny and very filthy. Yes. <laughs> and we go, you're looking at it, that's what it does. And they go, well, doesn't it move? Doesn't it talk? It did on the show. And we go, it was a suit. There was a guy inside. They go, there was a guy inside? And I said, you know, technology being what it is, you know, I have to tell you, there aren't robots that work like that, nor were there ever. You know, it's very scary. But Ron, I have to, I have to also introduce by saying, uh, I met Ron because he actually built his own robot, full-size robot, from scratch. With and a beautiful advice, one, too, with, with, with advice given him by Bob, because Bob and, and Ron kind of worked together on it. We're and, very dear friends. And, and I had gotten to know Ron that way, and so when the robot needed extra restoration, Ron, is a brilliant craftsman, much more than you know a robot wrangler. I mean, he's a brilliant craftsman, and and all of the electronics, the voice chips, the, the all the detail work on the chest, the differences between the robot in 1990 and the robot as it looks today, and the duplicate robot and the way that functions is this gentleman right here. So, of the new movie, and I was kind of caught in the middle because Sheila and the people from 20th felt that I was involved enough with the series to kind of be a consultant with New Line. Well, I was involved with Batman when Batman had a similar transfer in 1989, and Warner Brothers did their new Batman, and I was involved with the classic Batman. And Warner Brothers wanted to kill Batman. I mean, they would rather have bought every copy that Fox had of the Adam West series and burned it. I mean, they did not want it out there, they did not want to promote it, they would not license it, they would not come out with little classic Batmobiles, nothing. New Line Cinema, I have to say, in a very ingenious and risky move, uh, very unusual marketing mentality, uh, started, they got, the they got the rights to do a new Lost in Space, they knew it was going to be a very different movie, but they said, we have to honor the fans, we are not going to make the same mistakes made before, we are going to actively license and merchandise and promote the classic series. Now, that was a tremendous benefit to Fox because Fox is selling classic videos right now, like they're going to stop. <laughs> but, uh, but I have to say, the the new line has been the biggest booster of these gentlemen. Uh, they insisted that Dick Tufel do the voice, not only for the classic but for the new movie, uh, and and that was again a choice that they made. And, and I have to say that, you know, the robot is all over the country. It was in New York at, at, the, at a New Line press event. Jonathan Harris, the original cast members, have enjoyed a tremendous relationship with New Line, uh, who have been very, very good to them. Totally different. I, and I have to say that because it's not the kind of contentious, our movie is ours and we don't care about the old at all. It's a very, very nice fit. And I know that we've got, you know, Jim Lotta here from IBS. <laughs> And, 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 and icons, you know, very shrewdly and very cleverly, and God bless them, uh, you know, were the first in line to license the right to do a classic robot replica, which no one more than me knew how many people really wanted one. And so, uh, and, and Jim, you know, scored the coup of all time by getting the right to do a full-sized exact robot replica, which is what they're advertising and, and they're displaying uh, as work in progress. You know, right down the uh, down the courtyard, right over here. But but I have to say, you know, that's it's a very ingenious strategy uh, for New Line because you know there's a lot of movie companies. For projects for Irma, I haven't seen her in a while. She says, you know, we're doing another project. You'd be perfect for the wife of Vito Scotti in uh, Adventures of the Queen. 
And you said, I'm going to go tell Erwin. Because out of sight, out of mind. And you went and told Erwin, and I got to play Vito Scotti's wife. And uh, you know you know, Vito Scotti looked like? Little tiny Vito? He was, uh, I was his wife, and we were on our honeymoon. And he got seasick. And I said, how could you do that on our honeymoon? And I was like, what was the But she did this. She said, this is a marvelous lady who would do something like that. So I have to tell that story. She's a beautiful, wonderful actress and a wonderful lady. All of the people on this panel, I've never met you. I, uh, that's Robert Pine. <laughs> this is come up with at the moment was my own. Ego, ego, ring, you know. So I see him face Vikings, Hilda, and so forth. And um, but the truth is that my favorite was the girl in the green dimension. <laughs> oh, that lady you, out there floating around saying, "Don't you see?" <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I love a lot of them. Actually, I was not shy. <laughs> And I have to watch every one of these every week. <laughs> so um, I have forgotten something. Anyway, you are all wonderful. You are all wonderful. It's a great pleasure to be here. And, uh, and a great pleasure to have you. We're going to be asking you some questions oh, okay. about your career. Uh, no, 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 stay there. Uh, I, I was going to ask Francine first to tell us about. It's very interesting to see the difference in the audiences. The audience here was a little restrained, very sophisticated. And believe it, sophisticated New York went crazy. So uh, I was thrilled to see that, and I understand it's doing beautifully. Mm -hmm. You can't get in. Well, that's good <laughs> so, news. <laughs> yeah. That what would Irwin say about well, it? Well, Irwin and I, when Poseidon first came out, you know, and that was the first one, the first disaster movie to to uh, have people going back and seeing it over and over and over, and the lines were around the block. We'd go down to Westwood and, and just stand there and watch the lines, you know. <laughs> really wonderful. And as you were saying about Jonathan, this is the most marvelous man to work with. Uh, he gives so much. <coughs> you come right up and give with him, you know? So uh, He's real theater. He's a, oh, yes. He's, he's really, from the theater. I'm oh, from the theater. Yeah. I, I'm There's really a difference more. when you have that kind of background. Right. And, and yes, because, and, and of course, the funny thing about actors from New York is they never want to stop. They, you know, if you make a mistake, they go right on. Here, I, I never caught on to the uh, the idea of acting where you don't like it, you're, you're doing yourself, you say, I'd like to do this again. Uh, I, you know, I, I start, I have to keep going, you know. Well, like if you're on the stage and the scenery falls on you, you make it like it's part of like, you know, what you're supposed to do. Right? Yeah. Uh, now, you were, you were working for Irwin on Lost in Space uh, for a couple of times. Uh, did you have a contract with him at that time? Did no, I, my first uh, experience with Irwin was on uh, uh, the sky is falling in Lost in Space. I play what I always describe the character as a mute Apache. Because uh -huh. I didn't speak. And uh, the interesting sidelight to that was that after the uh, episode was completed and they were going to dub in the dialogue, and everyone saw it and said, We don't need that. We did it all with his body language and his eyes, which was a compliment to me. And he came down and paid me that compliment. And I didn't know him that well at the time, so I just said, Thanks. You know? It's my job, but I, I was told later that he didn't do that too often, uh, so I felt really good about it. Then he had me back for um, IDAC. <laughs> Which I understand I, is supposed to be a, a takeoff of Superman. Did they actually oh, say yeah. that to you at the time that we wanted well, to make Well, they fun? didn't have to. I had to look like Superman. <laughs> I had silver makeup on in, in the, um, the black and white episode. People couldn't really tell, but I had. Um, sort of a pasty white makeup and lipstick, so that you can see my mom. Your uh -huh. strange makeup, but and and a headband, uh -huh. and I, but I didn't have a feather. But we had like deer skin. As I recall it, I'm, I'm, I'm a little. I haven't seen that episode. And then I, I, of course, I had the blue tights and, and, and the cape. And the well, why did Irwin like to bury you in makeup every time? Now, <laughs> you were uh, you were in the episode of Voyage where you were completely covered by a, a man-fish type of costume. Going back to, to, to IDAC before you get to that, when I was wearing this silver makeup, I mean, it took a long time to put it on, and of course, almost twice as long to get it off, but at the same time, I was doing Lady in the Dark at the Pasadena Playhouse with Barney Nixon. So I'd get off the set, try to get this stuff off, jump. Sometimes I couldn't. And fortunately, we were just in rehearsals. I jump on the Pasadena freeway in the silver makeup because you pray to God yeah, when you get stopped. Well, nowadays that is an unusual course. Um, 
But and then uh, the, the situation with Voice and Bottom of the Sea, I played a character named Proto. Now, I was under contract for one at that time. I was Because Land of the Giants was coming out. For Land of the Giants. And I had done the, the uh, a few people know this, we didn't have to do a pilot with everyone's track record. And, you know, he told the network, I want to do this show. And he said, well, what's it about? And I said, I'll show you. In 10 or 12 minutes, so we did a presentation. And I did the presentation for Land of the Giants with a, a giant cat. <coughs> And uh, I, I never mentioned that in the two years we were on to the rest of the cast. Deanna knew eventually, but I didn't think they would. You're the first one there? Yeah, I was a teacher's pet. You know. but, but, but so he had you under contract. So he had me under contract. He, he, we couldn't get it going quickly enough, so he called my agent and asked for an extension. So we gave him like two extensions. And finally my agent said, well look, uh, he belonged. Why don't you, you know, put him to work and pay him some money? He said, well, I don't want to use them up. I want to, you know, I want to sort of a fresh face. And he said, let me think about it. So he called him back. He said, I got just the part. He said, I'm guest starring role on Voice of the Bottom of the Sea. He said, well, I thought you didn't want his face. He said, you, you won't see his face. <laughs> He'll be wearing a, I said, well, well, I'll be wearing a mask of some kind. Or, it was a mask, all right. I, was, I, I, I don't know how many of you saw the episode. I was covered from head to foot. In, Slimy man. green yeah. scales. I was a uh, cross between a, a fish and a reptile. Mm -hmm. And I'm feeling well, But you know, the thing that got me is that you actually dove in the tank. I did it. I, I played with a chimpanzee. You know what they say? Never play with children or animals. <laughs> <laughs> so, <I'm> very interesting. <laughs> well, now uh, Robert Pine, I guess, got away pretty easily. <laughs> His episode, you weren't in makeup. You're just uh, a guy. That, that's very true. But it's a little bit of a disadvantage, you know, when you. Uh, uh, these people here have a, a, a very inbred into Irwin Allen. Uh, I had this one uh, one trip uh, that I did on this particular episode where I played a uh, this sort of country bumpkin in 1947. Now, if I had worn points in my head and <laughs> fishy scales and stuff like that, I think I might remember more about the experience. But what I do, do remember about it is that um, I'd been under contract at Universal for three years. The, the first job I had in, in show business, I was put under contract at Universal. So uh, that was from 64 to 67. The first job I had coming out of that, being very nervous, wondering whether I could really make a living at this when I didn't have this uh, studio uh, taking care of me, was, um, was lost in space. So it has a it has a real meaning to me there. And when uh, Mike called me to do this, he said, "Well, do you have any uh, stories that you remember about the trip?" And I said, "You know, I can hardly re I, please forgive me. I can hardly remember it. Though. It's 31 years ago." And um, now you watched the episode. Though. I did watch the, did episode. the episode. Yeah, I like all the hair I had. <laughs> <laughs> and. Uh, I just couldn't believe how young I looked. <laughs> and you put that rope around Marta. You got I did that. put it in an interesting thing. I ran into Marta today, and I didn't put these two things together. Marta and I did a movie together a year ago, and I played her a brother-in-law, and thought I was meeting her for the first time. I didn't realize that I'd roped her 30 years <laughs> earlier. <laughs> and uh, so we had a nice little reunion this morning. And um, uh, I remember. I remember it was very hot when we did it, and as I watched the episode, you mean I hot outside. <laughs> and, and hot outside. No. She probably made me uh, heat up too. But at, the, at that particular time, I figured it out. I was also courting my wife, which was a new relationship for me, and that was 31 years ago, and we're still together. So, I do remember all the cast was very sweet, very supportive, and uh, and uh, how can Jonathan Harris not make a uh, an impression on you? <laughs> this guy is really fun and over the top. Stay together for 31 years, Robert. That's what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> Just stay together for 31 years. <laughs> um, it, uh, but it was a, it was a wonderful experience, and as I watched this episode, I'm thinking. Where did we do this? I'm thinking they're probably high rises now where we did this because this was on the back lot of, uh, of 20th. 
and uh, I was wondering which 37-story uh, building was where this little uh, uh, rustic scene that we were doing in this episode. But um, it is I, sad to think that all those wonderful sets are all long gone. Oh, and uh, from all most all the studios. I mean, I did chips over at MGM, and uh, of course, when I was there, it was gone. They used to have uh, a lot one, two, and three. Two and three are now uh, buildings and everything. So uh, all of that stuff is uh, yes to you. It was fun to. I remember being that age and uh, being with actors who are my age, 50 years <laughs> and having them talk about the old age. And now here I am, an old fart, talking about the old age. So uh, um, it, it's a pleasure to sort of bridge the gap like that. Uh, thank you. By the way, have you got any children? Yes, I do. I have a, a daughter who's uh, 25, who is now an actress, and uh, will be seen shortly on a commercial for Levi Dockers that uh, is sort of a send-up of the old graduate, the, the film The Graduate. So when you see it, she plays the Catherine Ross. Well, we, we expect you to show her that episode that you're in. So I did. I showed it to her. I said, honey, you know, <laughs> I'm your age there. That really knocked me out. <laughs> and I was a, a son who's 17. Oh, okay. Yeah, they're great kids. Okay, now sitting next to him, uh, and, and again, thank you for being here today. Oh, it's my pleasure. Uh, Lou Wagner. Uh, <laughs> Lou Wagner uh, was so good in that episode, uh, The Haunted Lighthouse, and thank you for being here today, Lou. Uh, I was talking to Lou on the phone because I, uh, we were talking about the dragnets that he had been in. And uh, Lou, before you, you talk about being J5, could you just tell the audience how you used to do Dragnet and what Jack Webb did to get the show done so fast. A little about being on that show? Yes, uh, uh, aside from Penny and, and, and enjoying working with her and, and the rest of the cast, I remember two, two very interesting things. One, uh, uh, before we started, Bob came up and said, uh, do you remember anything about your show? You know, it was so long ago. Uh, fortunately, I was working with a lion in, in our show. So, there's a couple of very unique stories about the lion. Uh, that lion was probably the most famous showbiz lion in the world. His name was Frazier, and he was probably the oldest living working lion also. He was the, the lion that they used for the roar in MGM. And uh, he was very prolific, had a lot of offspring. And uh, the actors never worked with the lion. We did it all the uh, reverse shots and then the lion would come in and uh, the interesting thing about that is that uh, nobody was allowed on the set except the trainer and the lion and the uh, cinematographer and the sound people were in a cage and the lion was free and that's how they, that's how they made those scenes. Uh, the other thing that I thought was interesting and uh, you know uh, you're the kind of guy who always kind of looks younger than he is, and uh, you know, let's just say you're like me, you're over 40 now. But yes, yes. how old were you approximately, just Paul Park, when you did that episode of Boston? Uh, Paul Park, I was about 26. I, I was able to look very, very young, and that's how I was able to keep working. Now, if you if you visit uh, Lou's table upstairs in the celebrity room, there's a picture of him with, uh, with uh, Angela. And it, you, you really look like you're 15 or 16 there. Yeah, I know. So, uh, <laughs> uh, Lou, it's a delight to have you here today. And the room, when we open it up for questions, uh, you know, we'll, we'll be back to you in a minute. Uh, our last guest down there is Bettina Marcus. Bettina, hello. <laughs> Bettina is, is uh, I've had the chance to spend a little bit of time with Bettina, and she is a delightful person, and I'm so glad that she came all the way back here to Hollywood uh, from Las Vegas. To, that is the loudest rewind I've ever heard. <laughs> That's okay. Uh, she came all the way from Las Vegas to be here. Uh, I've been telling her how the fans, you know, would like to meet her, and I've seen a few of them come up, and they've been kind of uh, making a big fuss over you, I think. Well, I'm really enjoying everybody very much, and very happy occasion for me to be here. It's been a long time that I've been away. And I wanted to say that when I was a young girl, I used to imagine that I came from a planet where 
Not only was there air to breathe, but there were beautiful tones of music that was part of the air, so that I was always breathing these beautiful tones and those beautiful rhythms. And I used to tell people about the planet I came from. <laughs> and then before I was asked to be interviewed for the Green Lady in Lost in Space, I had just done a painting of a flower with antenna floating through a fiery green space. Just before, and then right afterward, I was asked to go on the interview. And I often think about that because the Native Americans do sand paintings where they draw things to them. And I thought, hmm, isn't that something? Well, the creative visualization, I think. Let's all go to the desert quickly and start drawing. <laughs> I, I didn't know that's what I was drawing to me, but that's what happened. Um. I think that possibly there's a movie down the road. I'm not even going to look to my right because the <laughs> boss is sitting there. It would really be nice. Uh, there's, a, there's a couple of ways to go. They could do it real time and, and have us old codgers show up, you know. So I don't know how far I can climb that rope today, but I could get up pretty far. No, I think there's a, there's a, there's a lot of talk going on and uh, a lot of... Uh, um, um, what's the word? Well, there's a buzz. There's a lot of interest. Yeah, a, lot, a lot of interest is the word. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, because all, all, all of Irwin shows, nobody seems to get home. When I got the part of J5, uh, he uh, gave me a pair of uh, Spock ears. So they are Spock ears. Genuine Spock ears used in that episode. <laughs> I mean, uh, you know, uh, I think it's true of just about anything that you do. You come in with as much, you know, and the director will say, uh, well, yes, we like this, we like that, or yes, more of this or more of that, or don't do that. But I mean, as an actor, you come and you come like, 90, I do, I think we all do, 99% prepared, and so you dump a lot and then you keep a lot. I, I, I worked in front of the mirror, I, I practiced every little move, every little turn, every everything, to, and, and, and to feel and walk like the character and, and to put my body into Neolani's body more or less. I became the Olani. <laughs> and I think that this is the secret of, of a true performance. You, you, all the, the things you see, and uh, you know, a lot of actors, <clears throat> you see them perform in various uh, movies, and, 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 and they make it look so easy, like Jack Nicholson makes it look so easy that we, we don't think he's acting. But the hardest thing is to make a performance look easy in, in, uh, for an actor. When, when, you know, that's and to, to be real and to be the person. And, and to walk in their shoes, that's the most difficult. So I, I think we had a certain amount of leeway, although if we did something that was just so wrong for the character, naturally, Erwin would come flying down. <laughs> oh, he flew down quite a bit. Don, Don, let, quite a bit. God was speaking. We, uh oh, here he comes. <laughs> Don, Don that's a, uh, Francine brings up a good point earlier that she said frequently you couldn't see the person you were talking to a giant. So, uh, you oh, know, absolutely. relating to that question, you know, uh, uh, talking to something imaginary or reacting to something, how did that affect you, you know, being used to looking at another person? It, it drove, it drove a, a little crazy until you got used to it. But it really, um, it, uh, it helped you hone your acting skills because you were really acting. I mean, you had to find something in yourself to make that little spot on the ceiling. They'd shine a light up there where the giant's face was supposed to be. And uh, you had to make that real for yourself. And sometimes, much to his uh, chagrin, we'd get Steve Marlowe, our dialogue coach, up on the highest ladder, or, or sometimes up on the catwalk, and he'd have to read the Giants' dialogue, but it's still, you know, this little voice coming back at you. So it, that, when we got used to it, it was, um, uh, it was okay. It was a, a real challenge at the beginning. We had a situation in the second years of, uh, of Giants where we came in, uh, uh, all the actors got together and said we'd even come in earlier uh, so we could uh, have a script conference and sit down and not actually rehearse but just read the script and go over the rough parts because after being in a, a serious situation for a while you know your character as well or better than anybody else and if you get new writers and new directors in they'll say have Mark do this or do that and you say well no he, he wouldn't do this or say that and uh, and they say, oh, okay, well, what would you say? 
and so they, you know, incorporate that. And so when you get up on your feet to do it, you're not you're not having these 15 minute delays while you fight it out with uh, with the director. Because I went on the show, and uh, there was only one.